Hello everyone. Welcome to the practical sessions of Robotics and Mechatronics module, conducted by the Department of Electrical Engineering, University of Moratua. This video is about the practical titled, Operation, Control and Programming of KUKA Manipulator. First, we will look into the objectives of this practical. In this practical you will get familiarized with the components of a KUKA robot manipulator system. And familiarize with the procedure to develop a program for a KUKA manipulator using the teach pendant, to accomplish a given task. Let's look into the components of a KUKA robot manipulator system. The first component is the robot manipulator itself. The manipulator we have in our robotics lab is the KUKA KR6R906. It has 6 degrees of freedom. A maximum payload of 6 kg. Maximum reach of 901.5 mm. And pose repeatability of 0.03 mm. The next component is the robot controller. A manipulator is moved by means of servo motors or stepper motors that are controlled by this controller. The KUKA KR6R906 manipulator is controlled by KRC4 controller. It has the capability to determine the path to reach a specified target. It can control the speed of the motors. It has safety features to immediately stop the manipulator when it detects that the manipulator has collided with another object and it supports communication via bus systems such as Ethernet IP and Profinet, which enables it to communicate with PLCs, sensors, and actuators. The next component is the Teach Pendant, also known as SmartPad. A user can operate the manipulator by means of this Teach Pendant. It has a touchscreen that can be operated by hand or by using a stylus. Let's look into this teach pendant in detail. On the top, there is a button to disconnect the teach pendant from the controller. There is a key switch on the right of this button that is used to set the operating mode of the manipulator. We will look into the different operating modes later in this video. There is an emergency stop next to this key switch which is used to stop the robot in hazardous situations. The emergency stop button locks itself in place when it is pressed. It has to be rotated clockwise to release and operate the manipulator again. On the right side of the teach pendant, there is a space mouse which is used to operate the robot manually. The position and orientation of the end effector can be adjusted manually using this mouse. Next, we have a set of jog keys that are used to operate the robot manually as well. Using the jog keys, we can control the joint angle of each joint or the position and orientation of the end effector. Below that is the program override button that is used to adjust the speed of the robot motors when it is executing a program. Below that is the job override button that is used to adjust the speed of the motors when it is operated manually using the jog keys or the space mouse. At the bottom, there is the main menu key that displays the menu items. On the left side of the teach pendant, there is a button to display the keyboard. It is generally not necessary to press this key to display the keyboard as the teach pendant detects when keyboard input is required and displays the keyboard automatically. Below that is the stop button. The stop button is used to stop a program that is running. Below that is the start backwards button. This button is used to start a program backwards. That is, it executes the program step by step from the bottom to the top. Next, there is a start button which is used to start a program and executes it step by step from the top to the bottom. Below that, there is a set of status keys. The status keys are used primarily for setting parameters in technology packages. Their exact function depends on the technology packages installed. On the back side of the teach pendant, we have three enabling switches. The enabling switches have three positions, not pressed, center position, and panic position. To hold the switch at center position, it should be pressed gently. If it's pressed harder, it will move to panic position. This is included as a safety feature. In order to operate the manipulator manually, using the jog keys, one of the enabling switches must be pressed and it should be held at center position. If the operator gets panicked and presses the enabling switch harder, it will move to panic position and the manipulator will stop moving immediately. 
Now, let's look into the different operating modes of the manipulator. The operating modes can be classified into two categories, manual and automatic. There are two modes under the manual category, T1 and T2. There are two modes under the automatic category, automatic without external and automatic with external. We will look into each of these modes in detail. Let's look into the manual modes first. T1 mode is referred to as manual mode with reduced velocity. Jogging and program execution is possible in this mode. Jogging refers to moving the manipulator manually using the jog keys or the space mouse in the teach pendant. The maximum velocity that can be set in this mode is 250 mm per second. T2 mode is referred to as manual mode with high velocity. In this mode, there is no restriction to velocity, and the manipulator can operate at higher speed. However, jogging is not possible in this mode. Only the programs can be executed in this mode, and velocity when executing program corresponds to the programmed velocity. To be in automatic mode, jogging is not possible and only the programs can be executed. The velocity when executing program corresponds to the programmed velocity. The automatic mode without external mode is used when it's not required to connect any high-level external controllers to the manipulator. The automatic mode with external mode is used when external controllers such as PLC has to be connected to the manipulator. Let's look into the stages of developing a program to perform a task. The first stage is called teaching. Here, two procedures are carried out. The first one is the tool center point or TCP calibration. TCP calibration teaches the controller where the tip of the tool is located relative to the final joint and how it is oriented. The second one is the base calibration. Base calibration creates a coordinate system at a specific point in the robot environment relative to the world coordinate system. The second stage is programming. Programming can be done in two ways. The first one is online programming using the teach pendant. In this method, the manipulator must remain active while programming. It will to be moved to the required target positions using the jog keys or space mouse and those positions will be defined in the program. The second method is offline programming. In this method, the manipulator can be turned off while programming. The program is created outside of the manipulator system and will be uploaded to the controller. Offline programming can be done using software such as KUKA Sim Pro and RoboDK. Once the program is written, it must be tested to see if it works correctly. Testing is done in two steps. First, the program is executed in T1 mode, with a reduced velocity. If it is successful, then it will be tested in T2 mode with the programmed velocity. Once the testing stage is completed, the program will be implemented in automatic or automatic with external mode. Let's look into each stage in detail. First, we will look at TCP calibration. As mentioned earlier, TCP calibration teaches the controller where the tip of the tool is located relative to the final joint and how it is oriented. During calibration, the distance between the tool coordinate system in X, Y, and Z, and the flange coordinate system, and the rotation of this coordinate system, angles A, B, and C, are saved. Tool calibration consists of two steps. The first step is to define the origin of the tool coordinate system. The second step is to define the orientation of the tool coordinate system. The origin of the tool coordinate system can be defined in two methods. The first one is XYZ four point method, and the second one is XYZ reference method. In XYZ four point method, the TCP of the tool to be calibrated must be moved to a reference point from four different directions. The reference point can be freely selected. The robot controller calculates the TCP from the different flange positions. The four flange positions at the reference point must be at least 8 mm apart from one another.
In the case of the XYZ reference method, a new tool is calibrated with a tool that has already been calibrated. The robot controller compares the flange positions and calculates the TCP of the new tool. This method is used to teach multiple tools of the same type with similar geometry. The TCP has to be moved to the reference point only in two different directions. The second step in TCP calibration is to define the orientation of the tool coordinate system. This can be carried out in two methods. The first one is ABC world method, and the second one is ABC two point method. In ABC world method, the axes of the tool coordinate system are aligned parallel to the axes of the world coordinate system. This communicates the orientation of the tool coordinate system to the robot controller. There are two variants of this method. The first one is 5D. In this variant, only the tool direction is communicated to the robot controller. By default, the tool direction is the X axis. This is used in applications such as MIG or MAG welding, laser cutting or water jet cutting. The second variant is 6D. Here, the directions of all three axes are communicated to the robot controller. This is used in applications such as weld guns, grippers or adhesive nozzles. In ABC two-point method, the axes of the tool coordinate system are communicated to the robot controller by moving to a point on the x-axis and a point in the xy-plane. Now let's look into base calibration, which is the second step in teaching. Base calibration creates a coordinate system at a specific point in the robot environment, relative to the world coordinate system. The objective in doing this is for the jog motions and the programmed robot positions to refer to this coordinate system. An advantage of doing this is that the points can be taught relative to the base. If it is necessary to offset the base for reasons such as the work surface has been offset, the points move with it and do not need to be retaught. Base calibration is carried out in two steps. The first step is to define the coordinate origin, and the second step is to define the coordinate axes. And it can be done in three methods. The first one is the three-point method. The second one is indirect method. And the last is numeric input method. Let's look at three-point method first. In this method, the origin has to be defined first. This is done by moving the TCP to the point on the environment that is to be used as the origin of base. Next the positive x-axis must be defined. This is done by moving the TCP to a point on the positive x-axis of the new base. The final step is to define the positive y-axis. This is done by moving the TCP to a point in the xy-plane with a positive y-value. The indirect method is used if it is not possible to move the TCP to the origin of the base. This occurs if the origin is inside a workpiece or outside the workspace of the robot. The TCP must be moved to four points whose coordinates relative to the base that is to be calibrated are known. The third method is the numerical input method. The values for the distance from the world coordinate system, XYZ, and the rotation, ABC, are entered directly. Now let's move on to the second stage, which is programming. As described earlier, there are two methods to program a KUKA manipulator. The first one is online programming using Teach Pendant, and the second one is offline programming. 
Offline programming can be done as an interactive, graphics-based programming, or text-based programming. In this practical, we will look into online programming using Teach Pendant. Offline programming will be covered in another practical. In online programming, four different types of motion can be programmed. The first one is point-to-point -point motion. In this type of motion, the robot guides the TCP along the fastest path to the endpoint. The fastest path is generally not the shortest path, and is therefore, not a straight line. As the motions of the robot joints are rotational, the fastest path refers to the path where angle of rotation of the joints are minimal. The second type is linear motion. Here, the robot guides the TCP at a defined velocity along a straight path to the endpoint. The third type is circular motion. Here, the robot guides the TCP at a defined velocity along a circular path to the endpoint. The circular path is defined by a start point, auxiliary point and endpoint. The fourth and final type is the spline motion. This is a motion type that is used to group together several motions as an overall motion. The spline block is planned and executed by the robot controller as a single motion block. The motions included in a spline block are called spline segments. There are three types of spline motions. The first one is spline point to point. The second type is spline linear, and the third type is spline circular. The procedure to program these four motion types are the same. First, set the operating mode to T1 mode and create a new robot program. Then, move the TCP to the position that is to be taught as the endpoint. This position should be saved in the program, along with the type of motion and velocity. You will learn how to create a new program, and save the data, during the practical. Once the programming part is completed, it has to be tested. First, the program has to be tested in at a reduced velocity in T1 mode. While doing this, the number of people inside the safeguarded space must be reduced to a minimum. If it is necessary for several people to be there inside the safeguarded area, then all of them must have an unimpeded view of the manipulator. If the testing in T1 mode is successful, it can be carried out in T2 mode at the programmed velocity. This mode is used if the application requires a test at a velocity higher than manual reduced velocity. Everyone should be outside the safeguarded space during the test. If the test operation is successful, the program can be implemented in either automatic mode or automatic external mode, depending on the application requirement. This is the general procedure to program a robot manipulator.